recording. All right, cool. Over to you, Mitch. Have you? Hi, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to Presendo for 2021. Very exciting. New Year. How is everyone? Yeah, busy, mate. Busy, busy. Good. It's uh, it feels like this year, as always, the first couple of months of the year just zip past. But uh, excited to get into it for a new year. Uh, thanks to our sponsors, as always, sticking with us. Hudson, it'll be good once we actually get back in person, I think, which will be exciting, and we can use some of Hudson's facilities. Mm. Script Runner, obviously, killing it at the moment. I've seen a bunch of their talks recently, doing good. And InSync, mm. as always. Yep. How long has InSync um, like they've been involved from right, right at the start, yep. right? Day dot. Yep. Yeah. They've been doing it yeah. from day dot. Yeah, doing so, it. yeah. Awesome. It's really good to have sponsors sticking with us over a long time. It's great. All right. To the news. Uh, yeah, as as alluded, in-person meetups are coming back. Yeah, um, we have chatted about it. Um, I think it's uh, we're getting to that that point where it's um, you know starts to make sense again. So stay tuned for that. Um, Obviously, I'll quickly jump on, in there. The, yeah, so yeah. Um, we are considering on potentially going back March. Um, I know I was talking to Pabs um, yesterday. Um, about it so there is um, I wouldn't mind um, yeah if we if we start resuming in March however I do understand that you know and this is not going to be any pressure on people for us to kind of resume I know some people are going to have arrangements obviously you got people from the SUSE group that are out of state things like that um, we're still going to be doing it over zoom and things like that so it's not particularly um, going to cause any issues there for people. We're just going to have more of a hybrid kind of environment. But, you know, if, if you want to come in and say good day, um, yeah, it's always it's always great to pop in and, yeah, and um, attend, so. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it personally. It's mm. good to, you know, connect with people. It's one of those excuses to get out, get out of the house now. Um, all right, uh, PowerShell Community Blog. This was just announced recently, yep. which is exciting. Um, I don't know all the details about it. Um, I know that Jason Elmick's involved, which is always good. Um, Probably enough, really. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's all we really need to know. <laughs> um, so effectively, so nice yeah. Get, yeah. Um, yeah. So effectively, yeah. what they're doing is they're lifting and shifting. Um, that's effectively going to be the new um, um, platform. Guy. Yeah, the new scripting guide, new platform for all announcements for PowerShell. So we're not going to kind of um, any like yeah, we're not going anywhere else now. So it's the it's the go-to place, which is good. Um, and you can um, this is other thing which is really important as well. You guys can write articles for it. So you can there's a submission guide. You go through a whole editorial process, but there is the ability to be able to actually um, contribute to that um, that space. Yeah, which is yeah. great and um via github the contribu contributions are all done via github and yep. you write the blog post in markdown which is great yeah I, I think it's part of a wider um uh trend with microsoft and powershell to really you know make it you know, get the community driving it basically yeah. you know they've they've got obviously a, like a, a a core team in microsoft but yeah they're, they're obviously wanting that you can see it over almost every decision they make now is extremely community driven and trying to get the community to, to drive decisions that are being made for it, which makes sense, I think. Yep. Um, so PowerShell Crescendo, that's a new project. I actually read about that the other, other day, which was quite cool. Mm. Um, it was blowing my mind a little bit, to be honest, when I was just sort of, because they're announcing so many different products, but being able to wrap up native commands basically, and turn them into PowerShell commandlets. I mean, there, there has been ways to sort of do that, you know, if you hack your way around it, but, you know, a more native way to do it was pretty cool um, and make, you know, make, I mean, certainly if you've ever tried to execute command line executables in PowerShell, it's always ugly. So this mm -hmm. is a welcome, welcome thing. I would highly recommend anyone looking at just instantiating like any command line stuff. I've actually been doing some recently trying to generate some certificates, um, turning them into a command that makes it a lot, lot nicer. So yep. um, definitely check that out. So um, yeah, yeah, definitely check that out. There's no link there, but we'll drop a link, drop a yeah. link in that one. For, uh, it's, it's available in the PowerShell gallery. So if you search Cristando in the PowerShell gallery, you'll come across it. 
yeah, I think yeah, it's like, yeah. it's also like the top top result if you look it up. Sure <laughs> yeah, you'll find it. There, so <laughs> yeah. you're not going to find anything else. Gone, uh, gone are the days. Everyone's now just going to use crescendo and then rap ping. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, and we'll this, just, and, and, oh, sorry. Go on. Go on. And, and Snova always wanted this. I, mm. If you watch that yeah. talk from um, Don Jones, I, I think it was our last talk of the year last year. Um, you know, Snova wrote a whole bunch of command line tools before they started PowerShell. Yeah. And he, what, what they really wanted to do was make these native commands available in PowerShell. And they do it, you know, like it's, they're there, but they're not PowerShell. Mm. So it yeah. just feels like the icing on the cake, what he really wanted from the start. Yeah. Yeah. Well, to replace command. <laughs> to That's replace right. Exactly. Command, like, exactly right. You know, so, which they never quite, they never quite got to. So, no. um, that's awesome. Mm. Yeah, it's really good. Ignite feels like it was just here, but yeah. Ignite back it's again. Back. Um, should be good this year um, because they've honed all their remote um, learning. I don't know if it was um, the last developer conference, the last big one was. Uh, help me out. I forget what it was. Uh, it was the last big dev conference from Microsoft. Yeah, I forget the name of that as well. It was yeah. Ignite the tour. It was in Sydney, I think, was it? That was a couple of years uh, ago. No, the, the last remote one they did. Well, oh, yeah. The yeah, developer yeah, one. Yeah, build. Yeah. yeah, build. It was yeah, build. build, build yeah. Which was, like, amazing. So mm. if it's anything like that, it's going to be really good. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's free to so, sign up, guys, as well. So just go and sign up. Yeah. And then, yeah. and then the moment that you this things, uh, you, the moment those, um, the, um, the talks that you want to go and see, immediately go and um, just jump in there. Even if there's something that you're not sure, just jump in there anyway, because... Um, slots are limited, so um, that's weird. Yeah, yeah. And they, they, um, uh, the last ignite, and I've literally still got it open. It was very not that long ago. They had um, the the cloud skills challenge. I hope they do that again. Hmm. They Wait, have announced free, that as well. Yes, free certificates. Um, so you know, you just have to you do a little bit of tr training, basically, and they give you a free certificate. So definitely, like a hundred percent, get in there because yeah, free certificates, which is really great. Um, yeah, yeah, it was October. Wow, it was actually really, it wasn't that long ago. Oh, it really was, yeah. It there was you October. Go, there you go. I yeah. remember doing this. So they're, mm. they're, they're, they're ramping up again, I guess, getting back into their normal cadence. Mm. Um, so, yeah, yep. definitely check it out. It's, it's soon. So can you, can you share the link uh, as well in, in, in the yeah. Slack channel? Yep. yep. Yep, we can definitely do that. Yep, I'll just grab that yep. now. Perfect. Yep. Sounds good. Uh, and Azure Premium File, this is sort of, Big news. I think um, some of the other firewall vendors are kind of going to be shaking their boots a bit for this. It's just gone public preview uh, this month. So if you've, if you've used any Azure Native and they've had Azure Firewall, but it's just more more of that, more of what you'd expect from a Palo or a, mm. or a um, FortiGuard or a FortiGate, sorry, or any of those, you know, intrusion prevention, web categories, filtering, you know, they've always had a stack that could do a lot of this stuff, but, you know, their firewall premium or firewall product kind of gives you that like a firewall. So really very cool. And um, I think, yeah, some of the other vendors will be uh, keeping a close eye on it. So uh, we'll put drop a link in there to, to have a look at it. But, um, yeah, it looks really, really good. Central yeah. management, firewalls. It's a big, I think it was a big gap when you're talking about, like, uh, enterprise management of Azure resources because they always just kind of would be out there and then you have to put some other solution in always and it wasn't native and so they obviously heard that that need was there so yeah good stuff I don't know if, has anyone tried the public preview I haven't tried it yet yeah so. I was planning to uh, but it it's like the the firewall instances are quite expensive yeah so, I, I think, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so uh, I might uh, I might so I might give it a, a try. We're going to doing an Azure migration at the moment, so I might spin it up while we're doing that. If I if I do check it out, I'll I'll put something in the in the yeah. Slack channel. So, yeah. Yep. Cool. Cool. All right, That's I'm going to hijack. News. Yeah, I'm going to hijack the news cycle quickly for a second. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about DSC. Um, so one of the things about, we'll talk about the future of DSC, obviously everyone knows DSC is not dead. It's been actively worked on by the PowerShell team. Um, the other thing which is really important is that DSC, um, Steve, so Steve Lever over at the PowerShell team, um, had a, they had a community call meeting with Gail, um, and the discussion was, which way are we going to go with DSC resources, 
um, we're going to go stick uh, script based uh, we're going to go class based um, so the from the community call it seems that they are going to go for class based which means script based um, DSC resources will be potentially not supported going forward um, the other really actually cool piece of information which um, I kind of got a little bit excited about is that um, in PowerShell 7 they're looking at implementing DSC um, the ability to invoke DSC without actually using the LCM. So you can actually plug it into your own configuration manager, whether that's, oh, I just hit my, ow, sorry, chat. Um, whether that's um, Ansible, Chef, Puppet, things like that. So there's a definitely a massive future with that. And it's obviously they're pushing forward towards an integration with those um, larger configuration management tools. So food for thought, um, but yeah. Um, Another quick thing I wanted to quickly talk about is hopefully this week, it's either this week or next week. Um, this is just a bit of a preview. We So on the sidelines, I've been working um, on a project which is to um, release a PowerShell textbook. Um, now this textbook, we're still trying to work out what the name is, but effectively it's to target um, intermediate um, uh, tier um, professionals and um, students that basically um, want to get an advanced knowledge of PowerShell. So it's very similar to the um, conference books in that sense that um, there's that requires, they're mostly 400 topic talks. These are going to be more 300, 200s. Um, but essentially what we're going to be looking for in the next couple of weeks is a call for authors and call for editors. So the authors effectively will can select what chapter they would like to write. Um, those chapters can be, um, you know, it, there's a variety of chapters that you can select. Um, unfortunately, we can't actually take submissions for um, specific topics because we need to adhere to a specific standard, which we actually want to be able to market to um, different kinds of organizations and different kinds of learning institutions. Um, but the idea there is that, yeah, you can go ahead and um, write yourself, uh, write a chapter and chapters are going to vary. So this um, and a quite advanced content. So we're looking, you know, um, AST, um, we're looking, you know, PowerShell security, um, you know, Git, um, regex, things like that. So there's a fair bit of content around there. So um, you can probably uh, jump in there and have a look. Um, <clears throat> if authoring is not for you, um, editing could be. So editing, um, there's three types that we're looking for, but mainly we're looking for just your standard linguistic editors. So people who really just, you know, want to look at the grammar, um, focusing on the actual, um, the, the, the actual content where then we have technical editors to ensure that the accuracy of the um, of the content that's being produced is um, follows the guidelines and that it actually is met. Um, so that will be happening in the next couple of weeks. So if you're interested, um, yes, yeah, stay tuned. I'll definitely pop it on the Slack channel. If you're not on the Slack channel, um, you can definitely follow me on Twitter. It's on LinkedIn. So you'll definitely see it going through the grapevines. I know that there'll be a few people retweeting it. So um, it's, yeah, if, it, if it's something that you're interested in, also you can just hit me up on Slack and I'll um, see what we can do. So um, yeah, that's pretty much that. Um, we might as well go to the next slide. Oh, okay, show and tell, it's me. All right, um, so I've got a bit of a show and tell project that I've been working on for quite some, uh, over the last couple of months, but I'm gonna tell a bit of a story first. So um, initially when I was submitting um, my MVP contributions, um, it's a very, uh, there was a, there's an API. However, the API is only made available to people who actually have an active MVP subscription, um, which is, you know, that's a challenge in itself. So um, one of the things that you have to do is with your submissions is you have to go to the portal, add all those submissions to the portal. Uh, it's quite a lengthy process. Um, now, at that point in time, I stumbled in upon um, Adam Descroll's um, Selenium and um, PowerShell module. And I kind of got to work with that and had a bit of a play around with that. And it was very interesting. And I just using some really hack me PowerShell, I managed to, um, I'm actually going to steal control now, Wayne, um, um, with some hack me code. Um, but, but, but I'll get you to stop sharing. Oh, do I have to actually hit stop? Do I? Sorry. Uh, yeah. That's my new Zoom noobness coming out. There actually, we go. no, there we go. Hang on one sec. Let me uh, go ahead and share. Um, but, 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 we share screen, screen one. Prepare, prepare for screenception. Okay, cool. 
All right, so um, this is actually going to be really funny for you guys to um, have a little look. So essentially, I wrote um, some basic HTML, oh, sorry, HTML, but wrote some basic um, PowerShell that effectively performed, um, automated the process. And um, I had a couple of people come up to me and say, hey, this is really good, considering that, you know, the process is a very long process. And it was actually um, something that a lot of people um, provided a lot of positive feedback on. And they said, hey, you should make a module. So what I decided to do was I um, wrote a module um, that is able to do it. And what it is, is it's what we call a domain specific language. So this domain specific language is a subset of it's a similar subset language of um, PESTA. So it's very similar to PESTA. Um, and the way that it works is effectively you write, um, your, you write your um, contribution as a DS, as in, in DSL. So as what you would call as a PESTA. Now it's quite interesting because um, one of the things that we've, I learned, especially around with writing domain specific languages is that the paradigm of writing code significantly shifts um, because of the, the the intricacies that you have to deal with um, within the, the the structure of itself however the advantages of writing a domain specific language actually um, 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 counteract that quite significantly and actually produce a really um, a really awesome framework to build upon. And what I mean by this is that, so this is the syntax structure. This is a good example. Um, you guys can see that. I'm just making sure everyone can see this on the screen. Yep. Okay, cool. So this is a, a standard example of what we call a, a standalone execute, a standalone, um, uh, a standalone um, contribution. It's one contribution. It's not really that efficient, but we'll get we'll make we're going to make this better. So um, you can see here we also got it. I clicked on something and it just decided to go to the top. <laughs> oh no, because it went to the actual um, the code itself. I actually want to go to preview. Um, so uh, but, 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 where where are we? Where are we here? We'll just go here. Okay. So you can see here we've got our, um, our contributions. Cool. And one of the really really interesting things here is that. Um, because we built on the structure, I could actually automate on top of this. And so what what I mean by that is, is that I created this um, parameter called MVP structure um, CSV. And so effectively you can pass a CSV and this is actually from um, BW and um, advice from BW and um, Rana, instead of actually writing the um, the DSL manually, I could actually just pass a, syntax, uh, pass a CSV file for people who are not so PowerShell inclined. And this is where um, it actually kind of gets really cool. So I'm just going to quickly jump into here for a sec. So you guys can have a bit of a, this is a, just a bit of a show and tell. So, so what's up? Okay. Uh, it's not here. Hang on. Oh, sorry. I just got to fetch a phone for my wife. Um, okay. So essentially what we have here is we have our MVP activity. I'm just going to quickly scroll down. And one of the interesting things is, is when it passes the CSV file parameter, we're going to obviously test the schema. Um, the schema is basically does the CSV file meet the required columns and rows and blah, blah, blah. So I'm not going to go into too much detail with that, but effectively it's just testing the schema. Um, and then what we can do is, and this is the really cool part of this, is that we can, rather than actually manually interacting with Selenium, what this module does is it actually manually builds out, it actually writes out the um, the syntax needed to using the DSL itself to actually make the contribution on your behalf. So if we quickly go over here, you can see here we're going to create a fixture and a fixture is effectively just a script block. So it'll go ahead and create a, a fixture um, and we can actually just, we're writing, um, we're going to dynamically write the PowerShell that's required to actually um, to pass that um, fixture. And then once we've done that, we can then pass in the arguments. Now I've just got a bit ahead of myself, so I'm going to quickly go back for a second and we're just going to quickly scroll down. So is everyone familiar with Pe uh, PESTA here? Just make sure like everyone's kind of across the board with, um, with it. So 
one of the features that you can do within PESTA is there's a called it's called test cases. And test cases is really good because it allows you to parameterize your unit tests. Um, so what I did is I wrote a similar um, similar based logic where effectively you can have an argument list. An argument list. Um, this is really not great for um, demoing. I'm not going to click anymore. Um, where is it? So what happens here is I can define my arguments and you can see here I've got my area, my contribution area, my date, my title, my descriptions, um, some additional information. And then in here, I basically can pass those arguments in, um, pass them in as parameters and then let them go. And it's exactly the same as a PESTA um, parameterized test. And this is really cool because when if we quickly step back to the CSV component, um, all it needs to do is dynamically write what the required input is um, based on the input here. And then all it does is dynamically generate the arguments and then it just invokes the DSL and that's it. So it's actually really, really interesting um, and how to do that. And this is one of the key things about and advantages of DSL is that if you can build a robust framework using the domain specific language, then um, integrations that go on top of that don't um, can just use the, the DSL itself and doesn't have to actually spend a quite a large amount of time, um, you know, within the code itself. So effectively, you're just um, abstracting away that um, that complexity there. So um, you guys are probably wanting a demo. So let's go ahead and um, fire up a demo. Um, if I can actually hide this. How can I hide this? Dock the bottom. We can just do that. All right, sweet. So... So what we got here, and this actually, this is um, another interesting thing, is that um, within the portal, the way that I architected this piece of code um, allows you to do some very interesting things. So, for instance, you can pass in automatically Australian dates, but the actual site requires um, it requires US date times. So what I did was, and this is where I think, again, PowerShell is really quite cool when it comes to doing these kinds of things, um, is we, what I did was, um, bu -bu 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 -bu, is within here, it tries and finds that specific element. And then what it does is it also looks at, is there a formatting property associated to it? So if there's an automatic form, Map property that's actually um, within the module itself, it'll reformat that specific string to meet the requirement. So it's a, it ensures that we are um, always log, um, adding the correct um, information and we're not minimizing the number of errors. So it's an interesting way of, um, of, um, of doing string formatting. And the way that that works is that you can see here, if we've got a formatting property, then we can invoke script block and format that data. So if, um, so what happens here is that if I quickly go to resources, um, HTML format here, you can see here we have a date. So anything with date, it'll actually run this PowerShell code, automatically pass it in there and automatically format the code into the required input field. And it also does it with the, um, the URL. So as you can see, we, all I need to do is just add additional, um, ha um, add additional um, hashes into this specific um, field for different, um, uh, different um, entries that I wish, wish to format automatically. So anyway, that enough, uh, that's enough. And let's actually sh have a quick look at demos. So first thing we need to do is we need to connect to the MVP portal. So I'm just gonna quickly hit F8 and we're gonna run this piece of code. Um, now I'm just gonna quickly log in. So bear with me for a second, but you can see here we'll um, now we've got a Selenium window. So let's go ahead and sign in. I'm just gonna pull this off the screen so I can sign in. So Michael, just while you're signing in, is that a special build of Firefox or something, or is that Firefox with an extension? What is that? So it's a what we call um, it. It's not a special build. It's effectively a DLL that kind of comes off the side of it, but it's a it's a custom DLL that's you need to download. However, it's included in the um, the Selenium um, module. So effect it sh it should work. However, um, there's issues with versioning so if you've got the latest version it yeah it gets a little bit wonky so um 
but yeah, it's just a it's a um it's just a DLL of that hangs off the side of it, and you don't have to worry about any of that. The um the Selenium PowerShell module deals with it. Um, I'm just going to quickly go to the the page. I don't particularly want to wait here for ages. Okay, cool. So you can see here we've got our community activities. So I've just got a whole bunch of tests here. So because I've just been trying to test this. So you can see here. Let's go ahead and let's go ahead and run this code. Um, Let's make sure I can actually get to there quickly. And you can see it automatically creates it. It's automatically adding it. And then it'll, it'll go ahead and save it. Um, once it decides to save, it's obviously, yep, there we go, now it's saving it. And this is actually something that's quite tricky, especially within um, doing this kind of action within a, um, HTML um, using a, like a Selenium web driver is that, this, this JavaScript and things like that don't behave as what you would expect. It's not a repeatable process. So what I had to do was write a lot of handling logic to be able to actually manage things like that. So one of the things I wrote, and Wayne, I don't know if you remember seeing this, was I rewrote a function called try tentative command. And so effectively, it's a, 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 a um, it's just a simple um, try catch command with um, a, a retry element to it. And this is quite quite critical because JavaScript um, is dependent on the browser, and sometimes you need to the browser actually needs to wait to load. So, and then you can see here we have other pieces of um, logic here. So, like wait for MVP element. So these are things that it's basically looking for, and you can see here we've wrapped it inside um, a, a tentative try to be able to actually ensure that um, it's working as correctly. And what we're waiting for here is that the um, the button is actually visible and that it's um, it's retrievable before we actually continue on with our automation. Um, so you can see there that was added. So that's yeah. So and now what we can do is let's take this to the next level. So one of the things that I forgot to mention is that, and this is just um, I'm just going to call this params. Um, one of the things that I forgot to mention was that within the PowerShell, um, this specific piece of um, code, sorry, um, is that you don't actually need the area and the contribution areas. Um, and what I mean by that is, is that if you specify the, um, the, the, the area and the contribution area within the param block itself, it will automatically um, invoke the value that's associated with it. So um, what it does is it looks at the AST there and it basically makes a decision whether um, whether to invoke it or not. Um, so let's just go ahead and um, add two entries here. So the first thing we need to do is just add area. We're just gonna go test one, contribution area equals test two. Oh, no, I can't do that. Sorry, no, I don't, you don't do that. No, because if I did that, um, area and contribution areas are actually valid. So what I might quickly do is go, I might just grab a one up here. I know that I have one here. Um, let's just use this one. Um, do that, get rid of that. So you can see here we have the date um, as passed in as a parameter now, and we have our area and contribution areas. And you can see here now date will obviously reference um, the parameter input, um, and this will remain the same. So let's go ahead and on this. So what we might need to do is add argument list and then pass the params in like so. Do that. While we wait on that, let's go ahead and run this. And so now, hopefully, this will automatically add it. Okay, so now we've got an issue here. The reason why is because number of articles doesn't exist. This is what I was trying to fix before. Um, so what we can do there is we just change this. Uh, what's it? Um, articles, number of views. I'll just change that to article. So let's just reload that. Let's 
give it another go. And you can see that it goes ahead and starts the first one. And the thing is, is that you can see it's waiting for a bit of time to um, save. And this is actually an interesting thing because the logic behind it, you just immediately think you want to click the save button. But yeah, it it needs to wait for JavaScript, which is a very interesting thing, especially around the um, these specific activity types and contribution areas. I uh, actually know the activity types because they dictate how this DOM loads the different um, contribution areas. And there you go. And we just added two contribution areas using um, parameterized input. So does anyone have any questions? Uh, Michael, um, <clears throat> you mentioned before um, uh, something about an API, so, but there is no API for this, right? This is, this is literally. Yes, yeah, so there's an API for the active MVP um, people. So if oh. you're, if, but however, if you're a nominee, Unfortunately, there is at the moment there's no way to have access to an API. So right. um, this is kind of the only tool that's available um, at the moment for people to be able to actually make submissions. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. And how um, if that if that page obviously changes? Yep. Or, or well, or or if they move an object, that doesn't really matter because you're looking at the actual. Um, like let's say they move the article field down one row, that wouldn't, you, you're looking for that obviously. It doesn't yeah, matter exactly right, are. yeah, that's exactly right. And one of the really cool things here is that it actually dynamically builds it out. So we can actually get, um, let's just use contribution areas here. So what it does is it will go and look at the HTML in behind the scenes and grab all the contribution areas from that and then um, effectively load that into memory. And then uh, it cases it the first time. So it'll, it'll takes a little bit longer for the first time, but effectively once it's done, it will case that specific, all the contribution areas into memory. So, yeah. But the issue is that I just actually noticed before is that um, they have made a slight change. So I actually do need to go through and update some documentation because they have they actually have changed some of the wording. And th this is the interesting thing is that, so if we, let's say if we go back to adding a new activity back here, um, I changed these just before, but they were, um, these I'm pretty sure were different before. So what it means is that um, you have a, um, you kind of got to be going back and just quickly checking things like that. And it's unfortunate because, you know, I can't test against a production site already asked for access and they get, didn't um, they didn't give it to me so it's realistically I'm kind of have to go through manually occasionally and um, yeah and also rely on feedback from the community that actually do use it and wait for issues to be raised so yeah that's about it um, so I'm um, does anyone else have any other questions or yeah, I had it. Uh, so uh, remember, while showing uh, the code, you were there was a tentative try. Yep. So is that a PowerShell uh, construct uh, or? That, no, that's something that I wrote. So it's one of Michael's little babies. It's one of my little babies. So effectively, what I it's a it it, it operates very similar to a try catch. Um, obviously, it's nest it's um, nested within a try catch. It looks like a try catch. Um, but it's not. So you essentially pass two script blocks within your try and your catch, and then basically you pass a retry limit, um, and then it will manage, it'll actually perform the retry for you, so you don't have to manage that. Do you want to just show us the code again, Michael? Because it actually looks like a try catch block, but it's not, it's 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 subtle. Yeah, it's very the, subtle, um... yeah. Um, I'm just trying to, it was new MVP activity. Oh, geez. <laughs> this will be shared, right? This is 100% um, open source. Okay. Um, okay. So if you, you can go, you can go to my GitHub. Um, I'll just quickly drag it on the screen. So you can see here, this is a try, a try catch, uh, a tentative try catch. So um, yeah, see the catch is actually a parameter. You can see it's a parameter. It's very sneaky, yeah. but it effectively is passed as a parameter. That's <laughs> yeah. um, the um, yeah. passing a script block. <laughs> yeah, and all I'm doing is passing script blocks. So it all it automatically invokes it. Um, one other little um, caveat that I found, and this is something that I think is quite interesting, um, is that so when it comes to invoking um, script blocks with parameters, um, I had to use 
um, I had to use an AND statement to be able to actually um, effectively pass the argument in. The reason why is you can invoke. However, the invoke method uses um, it use it uses positional based um, arguments, which was an issue because what would happen is if you pass an array of an array, um, it would just flatten that and see it as one array. And that was quite an issue to try and manage. So um, the easier way was to actually just um, splat it in this way. And the argument list, that's the argument list is um, this. So this is the arguments that it, that's what it's invoking that. So when it's um, when it's when it's invoking it, it's just splatting. It's literally just splatting that hash table in, and that's and then invoking this script block, and that's what, <laughs> that's how it's that how that's how simple it is. So yeah, I come across the same issue with the start job thing. Yep, where it flattens the um, the parameters, and so after that, I've started using the using uh, mechanism in which in which you can address the uh, the you can address the um, parameters or uh, yep. from the from the parent scope using with the using statement. Yes, um, I considered doing that. However, the issue what I wanted to do was have a seamless transition. So I wanted to be able to splat directly onto the script block and invoke it, so I didn't have to write kind of write dynamic using statements into code and then it starts getting a little bit messy on how to handle that. So yeah, this this was the, I think that for me, this was the cleanest approach, but um, yeah, that's pretty much it. There's um, not really much else. The, um, everything else is realistically. So I say I'll quickly uh, jump jump into something else. So um, the another interesting thing about this code is that even though this, this is a script block, it actually does test um, the script block to ensure that it meets the requirements. So if you write any generic PowerShell on there, it needs to have either an area, a contribution area, and values. Um, if it doesn't have those in there, it actually um, won't pass. So I wrote a custom parser for it, um, just using the PowerShell um, abstract syntax tree to actually do um, lookups to um, validate that. So it's it's very interesting stuff, um, but it's, a, it's an interesting uh, learning experience to um, learn how um, to write these these kinds of languages. So yeah, how did you get started? Like, what, what was what did you use to get started with the DSL? I just um, <laughs> I wrote it from scratch. Um, initially, it wasn't written as a DSL. I'm just going to stop sharing. Um, so um, initially, it wasn't written as a DSL. Um, it was written as PowerShell. So um, the the, inv the invocation, everything like that was like new. Um, it would be like select value, do this. So it's it a lot more like, um, what's, a, what's a good example? Um, the syntax structure of um, universal, a PowerShell universal dashboard. However, there was a, it was a little bit too PowerShell-y and it could have been simplified a little bit further. So that's why I kind of refactored into DSL. But it was just kind of, looking at what the architecture was and then refactoring it accordingly. So like um, knowing, and there was a lot of refactoring because um, the nest struct, the nesting structures and things like that needed to, um, to be changed. But yeah, and the cachings and things like that. So, and that's another thing is that I did break um, rules within PowerShell. So things like, you know, you shouldn't set script variables and reference script variables from other functions. However, I needed to set a case and that case needed to be um, reusable across multiple MVP activities. So I didn't actually slow down the application. But anyway, um, yeah, I think if there's any other questions, um, we might, oh, I see something in the chat. Is there any? Um, I want credit in the module. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I credit VW for the for the uh, for that um, and Rana. I credit those two. All right. Anyway, that's enough for me. Thanks. Well, thanks. That was really good, Thank Mike. You. Michael, Michael, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I yeah. never uh, considered using uh, DSL before. I'm definitely going to go be going and looking that up for sure. Yeah, it's. it's I've... 
first time when I saw this, I I saw a presentation from uh, a very famous guy, uh, PowerShell guy, Kevin Kevin Market. Yep. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, and uh, I think he did a presentation on DSL. That's when I came to know that okay, wow, this can be used in DSL as well. So yeah, interesting. Yeah. It it definitely makes it. Um, DSLs have so much adv um, advantage over PowerShell, especially for things like. Um, building on an automation framework. So if you have to abstract away a complex data, a complex automation piece, DSL is actually really handy for it because, as you could see, that CSV input, that um, all it did was dynamically generate the desired uh, the desired state. The um, the DSL required and then the parameterized input. So it literally just wrote it out for you and then passed it. So, you know, that, and that was because it was simple enough for me to be able to actually do that. Now, if I had PowerShell on the other hand, that syntax is going to be a lot more complicated and that's where it gets, that's really where the advantage of DSL is. Anyway. Oh, it looks awesome. Mm. I'll definitely be checking that out. All right. Uh, on to our second topic of the night, um, forgetting. So I wanted to do a talk on this. Um, I got a little bit of inspiration a while back, uh, probably 2019 maybe. Um, and I thought, I want to learn more about this. I want to learn more about why I forget things. Um, and sort of went down a bit of a rabbit hole, learned a lot, and um, it's changed the way I learn. So I thought I might um, uh, share that with you guys. Oh, have we got a chat or a message or something? Oh, good. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'll get stuck into it. Uh, so um, I just want to go back a little bit. I, I don't know if anyone knows, but I've been in IT for about 15 years now. And um, I haven't always studied efficiently. Um, the way I used to study was I used to um, do video training, then do hands-on um, hands training, like hands-on labs and stuff like that. And then I'd take some really detailed notes along the way. Um, and then this was usually multiple pages and I used to keep them in like a binder um, and then uh, flick through this binder. And then what I would do is I would sit practice exams and then I would try and like make these notes more concise. And I'd end up with a very small, um, a very small number of notes towards the end of things that I frequently forgot. And then I would take that with me to the exam day. I'd, I'd read it multiple times leading up to the exam day. And then I would, I called these express notes. Um, and then what I would do is I'd actually like sit in the car park and like read them again and again and again. And then I'd go in and I'd sit the exam. And this was relatively successful. And I was young and I had a lot of time up my sleeve. So um, it worked relatively well for me. But as I got older, I found that I had less and less time to study and I've needed to become much more efficient if I want to continue learning at the same pace or even a similar pace to what I learned, um, uh, you know, the rate that I learned at when I was much younger. Um, so I'll show you, I'll show you how long I've been uh, training for. So I'll just flip to the next slide. So this is, this is my express guide for Windows XP. 70-270 for anyone who's old enough to know that exam number. Um, and you'll see the notes in here are actually hilarious. You sort of, it's not until you go back that you realize um, that you realize how far you've come. Um, and um, my first exam, my first Microsoft exam was 70-270. And I, I've done 20 odd something now, maybe approaching 30 Microsoft exams uh, since then. And um, I feel like I've only recently worked out how to do it <laughs> and how to do it effectively and not only retain the knowledge for the exam, but also um, retain the knowledge for the job. So like I said, what I've learned is that the way I have been doing this is very inefficient. It takes a lot of time to take a lot of notes and um, uh, write, not only write them, but read them and learn them and read things over and over again that I may already know. When you've sat your 10th Windows Server exam, there's probably things you don't need to learn again. Um, like you probably understand group policy or you probably understand Active Directory groups and you probably don't need to go and do the training video on that thing. And you probably don't need to take notes on that thing. Um, so uh, with a bit of inspiration from Pluralsight, I did a bit of research and found out about um, 
what they call the forgetting curve. Now, what this is, it's a, a research done by a German psychologist called Hermann Ebbinghaus. He did research into why we forget, and he produced this forgetting curve. And you'll notice that people, when people learn new things, they forget things over time. But you'll notice the shape of the graph. And the biggest drop in things that you've learned happens within 15 minutes. So if you're if you're learning something new for the first time and then 15 minutes later, you're probably there's a number, it's probably around 85% you've forgotten of what you learned in the last 15 minutes or 15 minutes ago, I should say. So they, he also found, he found a couple of other things. He found memories weaken over time. The biggest drop occurs within 15 minutes. It's easier to remember engaging and interesting things. So the more interesting the topic, you know, the more you vary the way you learn, you know, like doing labs, doing videos, reading books, the more interesting it is, um, really matters. And also multiple external factors can affect the way you remember. Um, one thing that I've found is, and this is like seems silly because when I was younger, I did not care about diet and sleep and all these sorts of things. And they really play a massive part in how you learn and how you retain knowledge. Uh, it's shocking the amount of a change you can make to your memory by just going out and going for a run or a walk or doing a little bit of exercise, 15, 30 minutes maximum, a few times a week can make a massive impact to the amount of information you retain and you would think how can spending time away and I, I thought this when i was younger as well how can spending time away from my computer make me learn more about it it gives your time your brain time to relax recover recharge and build energy that allows you to go and study more and learn more and all that sort of thing so it's not only about your brain it's about your entire body so they found a solution uh, to this forgetting curve, and it's called spaced repetition. So they found that recalling knowledge that you've learned will help you retain the knowledge. And effective, an effective way for, for us to do this is through spaced repetition. So um, this is an evidence-based technique. It, it works. And what it allows you to do is you use flashcards, and they ask you to recall a piece of information. And then the information that you get correct, it'll ask you that, in that it'll show you that flashcard again later. Then it'll show you a flashcard that you got wrong. So when, you, when you've recalled information, that means it's made it further into your long-term memory and you don't need to recall it as often to remember it. So they've, they've come up with this process. It works extremely well. And the way I recommend you do it is um, you maybe go through your and i'll go into more detail on this in a second you maybe go through your um flashcards really often at the start and then you go through them slower and slower to a point i've got flashcards now that are like 1.5 years before i need to re revise them again that knowledge has now been stored in long-term um, memory i'll move on so this is how i suggest you use these flashcards is you um, create a question on the front of the flashcard. People will have seen flashcards in training. Like I know training com um, websites that I've used have, that give you a flashcard deck as part of the training. And for ages, I thought, what is this for? Like, why would I even use that? Um, and it wasn't until I started creating my own flashcards that I really found the advantage of this because the way everyone learns is different. And the way things become meaningful to you are different to you to everyone else. So I always create my own flashcards and I do them as I study. And um, what I do is you uh, create the question, create the answer. You ask yourself in your head, um, how, how well did I answer that question? And then you rate yourself. I, I knew that really well. I struggled to remember that. I had to really think, and you can feel your brain trying to pull it out of memory. It's like, I know this, I know this, I know this. Ah, oh, I've got it. That's a hard one. And you'd write that, I found that hard to remember. And the software, you can, you can get software that makes it easier to, for you to pull these cards up uh, when you answer them hard or they're hard to answer or when they're easier to answer. So there's a piece of software, like I said, that makes this very easy. I use a piece of software called Anki or Anki. There's, depending on where people are in the world, they call it different things. Um, I call it Anki. Um, 
and it's open source. It's free on Windows and Android, so that covers basically every computer on the planet. Um, it, um, it's not free on iOS, but um, I was happy to, they use their iOS app as a, as a funding source. So I was happy to give them a little bit of cash for them to get the iOS app. This application is extremely effective at allowing you to take notes in these flashcards and then um, uh, go through this learning technique to space your repetition out so you recall things. And I just want to make a couple of th uh, points about that recalling knowledge. You know, when people ask for experience in a job description or a, a job posting, they say, I want someone with five years experience. The reason they want someone with the experience is because they know that that person's going to be more efficient at doing the job. They don't have to go and look something up. You know, they don't have to go and ask a colleague. They can recall the information and then and then, then and then do the work. And that's why being able to recall knowledge is important. Um, so like I said, I don't know if there's anything else here. Um, yep, oh, sorry, there's an answer there from Tim. Yep, you can export and import cards um, from other people as well. Um, so that's definitely possible. Is that uh, yours? What, what's that, sorry? Is that, is that your screenshot, AWS? Yeah, my uh, screenshots, yes. Would you be sharing that with us, Wayne, please? <laughs> I can, yeah, you can see that Azure long-term, I actually use it long-term <laughs> long -term retention. Um, yeah. <laughs> it, but um, not only that, I mean, the other other topics looks uh, looks great. Yeah, so I'm currently prepping for AZ-104 at the moment, and uh, that yeah, that little green number five, I think I had five cards due at the time, uh, zero new cards. Um, AZ-500 I'm prepping for next, so I've got my deck there ready to start prepping for AZ-500. I've also got some AWS long-term retention stuff that I'm holding on to just in case I need to do AWS down the track. And I actually went through this with another piece of software, um, ServiceNow, um, where I worked at Oscript. They were deploying ServiceNow and then business decisions changed and I don't need to know ServiceNow now. So I've just dropped that into that unused uh, section down the bottom there. And um, Anki's not going to prompt me to go and recall that information and, and I can let that fade. I can let that knowledge fade. My brain will take care of that for me. It'll take out the trash um, and I can learn new knowledge. Um, service now, now, yes. So um, yeah, you can work this and obviously Docker is something that I'm learning at the moment as well. So that's, you know, that's in my list of cards. Um, and that's an example of a card that I've got there that um, you can see that the front of the card is actually the top and the back of the card is the, um, is the, is the, um, is the bottom there. And you can write these yourself. They can have images in them. Um, they can have all sorts of things in there. Um, they support HTML. Um, but people use this often for uh, medicine and languages. That's commonly what this software is used for, but it's, I found it's also awesome for IT. It's basically good for learning anything. Uh, uh, is there a community that just shares decks? I haven't seen a lot of this. And to be honest, I haven't looked for that. I'm um, just answering one of the questions here. I haven't seen a lot of people sharing uh, decks in the community. Um, it's something that I'd be definitely willing to do. I have no objections to sharing my cards. And the reason I don't know this is because, like I said, I create on my own. I, I think maybe I learn a little bit uniquely or uh, maybe it's a little bit unique the way I learn. I'm not sure. But I found other people's flashcards less useful than my own. Um, I found them okay to base cards off, but not to use as is. And it, that you, you, you might that might be different for you guys. So if you de definitely look at um, uh, try other people's cards if you're interested in that. I know um, uh, Linux Academy prior to it being acquired by a cloud guru, they had flashcards and they had them with the course, and they were kind of they were kind of handy. I, I don't know if they still exist on a cloud guru or not. Maybe someone else knows the answer to that. Um, but um, those flashcards were good to base your flashcards off. Uh, so just some tips for um, uh, dedicated learning. So there's, there's different types of learning that people do. And obviously when you're going, going and reading a book or doing a training video or doing a lab, that's dedicated learning time. You're like, I want to learn a new thing. Um, I had a few tips to get, to get some more success out of this. Um, study in short bursts. Do 15 to 30 minutes at a time uh, and then revise your flashcards. Don't, don't do an hour at a time and then revise your flashcards because you're gonna not you're not gonna pass as many of, as your flashcards at the end, and you're gonna lose more knowledge of things that you didn't um, pick up during the time. Uh, create your flashcards while you study. Don't write them an hour later. 
write them when you study and then revise them immediately after. Um, and hopefully 15 to 30 minutes. And a lot of training, you'll see a lot of training uh, companies do their videos in 15 to 30 minute sections. There's a reason for that. And that's because after 30 minutes, you guys are fading. You need coffee, you need something, you wanna be doing something else. Um, there's a reason those videos are that short and you should use that. And if you wanna go on and do a second video, that's fine. Just re revise your cards in the middle and then go on to another video. Um, and then before you know it, the new cards that you've created, they'll be, you know, it'll be days, it'll be weeks. And then before you know it, it'll be years before you need to re um, revise them. And that'll be stored in long-term memory. Um, and you'll be able to recall it in a flash. I have cool, it's awesome. Uh, so now some tips for some uh, informal learning. And so when you're not learning, just sitting in front of a computer, doing a lab, reading a book, that sort of thing, there's a lot of learning that happens around you. So collaborate with people, collaborate with people inside your team and outside your team. Um, uh, you will learn new things and you'll learn new things from unexpected people. Now, I'll be honest, when I was younger, um, I sometimes thought I was more brilliant than some of the people around me. <laughs> and I quickly learned as I got older that that's not the case. Um, everyone knows things. They just know different things. So you can always learn from people who know who you, th who you may think know less than you. They just know different stuff to you. So there's always the opportunity to learn from other people. Uh, another thing I can't stress enough, and I always push my team to do this as well, is do new thing, do new things, stretch yourself and learn in the moment. Never stay comfortable. Always be just outside your comfort zone because that's when you're going to learn the most. It's when, it's when your job's going to be the most interesting and it's going to be when you're more likely to remember what you're learning. Don't stay comfortable and don't throw yourself in the deep end either. Sometimes throwing yourself in the deep end is fine, but it's going to take a little while to get up to the top and start swimming comfortably. It's better to stay just outside your comfort zone. And if someone asks for help in your team or outside your team, give them help. Don't say no because you might learn something and they might learn something. And if they learn something, they might not need to ask you again. So that's gonna save you time. And if you learn something, that's a great benefit for you. Um, it's also extremely efficient to get people past their problems. If someone's sitting there struggling, they're wasting their time, they're wasting the company's dollar. It's much more effective if you help them out. Uh, tips for people who are leaders. Now you might not think, you know, if you're in this call, you're probably a leader, whether you know it or not, um, or whether you're officially a leader with a position title. Um, you know, seniors, team leads, anyone at this talk, you're probably leadership material, mentor material. If you're not right now, you definitely will be very soon. Um, so quit, one of the tips that I've got for people is if you've got other people on your team, quiz them. I, I must admit, I like to think I'm pretty clever sometimes and I like to say like, oh, yeah, I've got this, I know this. But it's much more effective if you ask someone else as well, because not only would they, might they give you an answer that you hadn't thought of, but you are asking them to recall knowledge and therefore you're training them. You're getting them to learn that material again and you're saving the trouble of them having to go and do a flashcard. <laughs> so they've had to recall that, um, that knowledge. Uh, and also, um, Get a mentor, like if you're getting on in your career, you've been around for a few years, five years, seven years, 10 years, definitely get a junior. Don't, like the business is gonna be like, you can't have a junior, it's too, no, you know, they're gonna waste their time, they, they cost too much money, they, they waste, you know, they're not as effective as getting a senior. That's all rubbish because you wanna be able to bring people up. You, and um, it's everyone's responsibility to bring up everyone around them. Uh, I also like to think if you're a leader, you should promote an environment where people feel like they can ask questions and get them answered and not be shot down. God, you're stupid. How do you not know that? Happens to me occasionally. <laughs> um, and be a mentor, like I said. If someone has a knowledge gap, and this is something that you really think they need to know, acknowledge it in a positive way and give them a chance to close that gap. For example, ask someone else in the team to give them a hand. Say, you know, Joe, can you please help? Matt, as an example, get through this. And then um, it might take a little bit of extra time to complete the task, but someone's gonna learn something along the way. Discussion time, thoughts?
that's all I had to say for tonight. What does everyone think? Excellent. I think uh, you flagged some really important points. <laughs> this happens with me. I mean, I try and watch videos, do things, try and set up lab, labs. And then, of course, because I'm not using that technology in real world, I, I mean, it fades away. This it has does. happened multiple times. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And, um, you know, there's nothing stopping you creating flashcards throughout your day. I've definitely done that. I haven't done it a lot, but I have gone. That's really interesting. And I, I want to remember that. At it, I've got the the app on my phone. I've got the app on my iPad. I've got the app on my PC, and they all synchronize. So if you learn something new, you can immediately flash, flash, create a flashcard, and you're going to remember that for later. Absolutely, that's happening just after this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and you're sharing your flashcards, right? <laughs> oh, so I'll share my flashcards. Yeah. yeah, like I said, they might not be valuable for everyone else, my but yeah, I'll, I can share them. My gone. I doubt that. Well, some good tips on um. Uh, because one of the things I always wondered about was how to, um, you know, when to create those flashcards, because I never went back to do that, right? So, um, I have used them before, but creating my own, it was always, it would always be a, an exercise much later, and that didn't seem to be obviously effective. Yeah. No, definitely create them in the moment. If someone's, and like, if you're using flashcards to pass exams, and I often am using them for that, but at no point are they not useful on the job. Trust me, like Microsoft doesn't get you to pass exams because it's not useful on the job. Some things are silly, but for the most part, what you're learning is very handy on the job as well. Creating them in the moment, someone says something to you and you think, that sounds important. Note it in a flashcard. Uh, the other thing I would probably add in terms of like learning something new is, um, and I, I tend to find this myself and I, I notice others like um, what... Um, Michael demoed before is when you want to try something new, um, just think about problems you have, even in your personal life or in your work things, a problem, and then just think about how you might solve that and then just go down that path. So it's much easier to stay focused on something when it uh, kind of affects you or could solve a problem in your own life. So all, all the best projects where I've like tried to learn something new were out of a frustration I had with something. So, like I said, with, with Michael's one, it was literally, you know, trying to upload, you know, MVP submissions and like, you know, look, look what's actually come out of that as problem versus solution. So I find that does help you, help motivate you spend the time outside of your work hours on something that um, when there's something kind of driving it behind. Yeah, yeah definitely. You're going to find it much more interesting. Yeah. I yep. found, I found, um, and this is actually, you, you, um, you pretty much hit the nail on the head there, Wayne. Like, I've never used flashcards, but I'm actually going to give it a go now because I think there's a, um, um, it's something that I've never considered. Like, the way that I do my learning is, oh, my camera's turned off, but um, the way that I do my learning is um, by teaching. Yeah. So, and that, you know, the best way to learn is to teach. And yeah. you know why they say that? It's because you have to recall the knowledge to teach it. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> it's a really, um, it's a really awesome um, way I've always found to learn something new. So, for instance, um, in the couple of weeks of talking about PowerShell security, so I really um, I had to go, you know, do a lot of research into PowerShell security and things like that. And it's, it was quite interesting because I wanted to, um, if yeah, if you want to learn about it, then yeah. And now, you know, um, I was having a discussion with some people today and I'm talking about it and I'm just saying, hey, this is actually the misconceptions because of this, 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 and this. Um, and being able to actually talk about that in quite in depth, which is something that, yeah, teaching really, really helps. Um, the other thing that I found, and this is something that um, I found with learning, um, especially around kind of PowerShell, is understanding just just go and do something brand new. I think Don Don Jones um, touched on in that last the um the last year's talk, which was, you know, just go and read something different. Like it doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, to your chosen topic. Just learn something every day. You know, make your mind in that culture of learning. And like for instance, the other day I decided, all right, why well, don't I just go and learn um, how to do um, Bitwise or a Bitwise and in PowerShell, and then. Then I learned, hey, you can do bit shifts. So you can actually shift bits to the left and the right in PowerShell. Um, there's operators to do that. So I was thinking, this is cool. And then I spent a bit of time mucking around in there and going, okay, now I understand that. 
Um, and so it's the first thing I did was I went and showed someone else it. So again, you know, to teach it to reinforce. That's it. Yeah. And you're going to remember that much better than how yep. you have not done that. Yep. That's exactly Definitely. right. Um, yeah. Any other thoughts or questions or comments from anyone else? I'm just going to quickly check the chat. Uh... No, I noticed a few people have downloaded Anki. Um, yeah. Yeah. You won't regret it. If you put the time in, you'll get the rewards back. I'm not saying it's like a get rich quick scheme. It 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 it's a it's a learn stuff effectively scheme. <laughs> That's all it is. Uh, nothing's easy. Nothing comes easy. Yeah. Mm. Oh, but this, him. <laughs> I was going to say at the um, at the same time that I was going to say Wayne. Then after that, you can teach the AZ five hundred. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, yeah. If, if I was to go and do a a course on, you know, the because the previous exams I did were the two AZ three hundred exams, mm. and if I was to go and uh, teach those at the end of when I did my flashcard training, I had, I had um over five hundred, I think it was flashcards in total between the two exams that I'd memorized. Wow. And that like that knowledge in the exam was just like bang bang. Bang, bang, straight through. Like Microsoft throws stuff at you, you're just like, yep, yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Yeah. Next, uh, it's next, a completely next, next. Completely different next. experience to what yep. I've had in the past. <laughs> it was mm. next, next, next. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And it was a difficult, they're, they're, don't get me wrong, they're very difficult exams, but mm. as long as you know your theory, you'll be fine. Mm. Yeah. I All failed right. the first attempt. <laughs> no wonder. Oh, on the, one of the AZ-300 exams? No, AZ-500. So I failed oh, AZ-500. Yeah, uh, I still have to... Uh, I'm preparing for AZ-303. Yeah. Yeah. Tough exam. Week, maybe. Uh, I can yeah. shoot you my, my decks if you want them. They, oh, they please. Yeah. Absolutely. Please, please. Thanks. Yeah. I've actually merged them together now, unfortunately, my two AZ-300 uh, decks. So that's unfortunate because they would have been more handy separate. But, but now it's in my LTR. I, 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 don't, I don't get them separate anymore. So oh, that's yeah. all right. So I was saying in the chat, I, you know, I completely agree with you making your own cards and using your own cards. And uh, Wayne, just on yours in particular, I guess, um, would you say that it's a complete set or is it a set of things that, oh, hang on, those are the things I need to learn? Because that's where, you know, borrowing somebody else's cards can be an issue because you might be all over something. I'm going to just pick your group policy example. So you might not bother putting the effort into creating those cards. You make you raise a very good point, and that's one of the reasons why, yeah, you should always use your own cards. Things that things that like if I were to go and study another Azure exam, like my AZ one hundred and four deck is only a hundred cards, but because I've done AZ three hundred, the two AZ three hundred exams previously, a lot of that's already in my long term knowledge. So the deck is going to be half as useful to someone who's coming on fresh. Mm -hmm. Exactly what the point you were making. I think as yeah. well as its context as to that as well, because if you write your own card, it might be, you know, you're writing to a specific context that you understand and that yep. can be misinterpreted as well. And I do a couple of different, and I'll even ask when I do flashcards, I'll do them differently. So mm -hmm. I'll do true, false. I'll do yes, no, and I'll do fill in the blanks. And I'll just straight up ask the question as well. Uh, like, do you know the thing? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, one of the things that they try and make you memorize for the Azure exams is app service SKUs. Don't ask me why they ask you to memorize this. It's completely ridiculous. <laughs> but I, I now know the difference between each of the SKUs and everything that changes between the two, including the fact that it goes from 10 to 50 to 250 gig across the SKUs. Like, it's a ridiculous amount of knowledge that you need to retain to pass the exams accurately. But it's there. You can do it. Mm -hmm. And of late, I've seen, I've been seeing that uh, they ask less of PowerShell based questions and more of uh, Azure CLI based questions. Mm. That's like being partial mm. to it. Uh, yeah. One, yeah. So. Yeah, and I find naming conventions are really good as well. I'll do fill in the blanks in the cards and naming conventions and stuff like that as well. Helps you remember the syntax of how like an Azure CLI command comes together or how you might do the scope in an Azure policy or something. Oh, this is all very Azure focused only because that's what I'm studying at the moment. But it applies to anything, any absolutely anything. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Anyone else have any questions? No, I'll, I'll power on. The... Um, only, only, other, only other slide I had was call for speakers. <laughs> yeah, call for speakers. Anyone want Michael to speak? and uh, Mitch, I'll let um, yeah, I'll let you guys take that one. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, if you if you've got a topic you want to talk about, or you think you you know you, even if you think, just hit us up. Um, 
you know, we can give you some time to come up with it, even if you haven't. Uh, it is a good way to learn. That is 100% true. <laughs> can uh, we nominate? Oh, can my you, God. Can you nominate? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just had lightning just go right outside my house. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, we do do lightning talks as well. So um, <laughs> if you <laughs> if you've only got like a short topic you want to talk about, we can do those as well. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> Rana, but, we could we could assign a speaker yeah. the way Wayne used to assign jobs. No one wanted with the uh, exactly. Of, uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I I have two nominations. One of them is not present over here. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, I have two nominations. Yeah, um, keep trying to convince them, Rana. You'll get there. <laughs> yeah. So, so Tim, awesome. so so Tim and uh, Jimmy from Wayne's team. Uh, one is one is excellent with BSC, and one is excellent with ARM templates and uh, uh, Azure pipelines for IS. More specifically for IS, definitely would want uh, would love to see uh, a their presentation. And I wanted to get everyone's feedback. So that was the first non sort of technical talk we've had. Do people think non technical talks are potentially a good idea occasionally, or do we think we should just stay technical um, after go, after having to sit through that? I think it's a good idea. Yeah, it doesn't always yeah. have to be technical all the time. You know, you can you know, sort of stuff like this and uh, show uh, um, you know perhaps other external tools that people find useful, like you were saying about the flashcards and all that helps you learn, which is which is all good. Yeah, there may be other tools out there that um, help people and might be worth sharing. Yeah, I'd love to see a share and care session on the, everyone's favorite VS Code extensions. <laughs> hmm. There's a whole bunch out there, and I'd love to see everyone do one of those. So many, so many. Yeah, I've got to do a session on, on VS Code, actually. Yeah, hmm. yeah. Good yeah. idea. Yeah. Setting it up and all the different, because there are some quite good extensions depending on what you're working with. And there's so many bad ones. Is that a volunteer right here? Uh, I, I, oh, God damn it. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that could be good. Yeah, I might, I might um, yeah, volunteer for that one. Uh, a short session on VS Code. I do have to install it often. And, um, I've been teaching one of my other team members about the benefits of VS Code and uh, getting them into it. So, yeah, it's fresh in my mind. Yeah, I'm happy to do one. So. Well, I, I turned the screen off because so that's, I think that's all we had for the night. Everyone's getting smashed by a storm, I think. No. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely, yes. Uh, storm's basically passed down here. Oh, mate. Yeah, okay. That's I'm just hoping that, like, awesome. I'm just hoping every time I see a bright flash of lightning that I don't have it explode outside our door. That's always fun. We're going to have yeah, to cuddle the dog those. for an hour again. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that's um, pretty much it for today. Um, is there anything else we want to discuss? No, I think that's it. We'll be back in late March. Um, yep. Um, yep. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to say we've confirmed a speaker, but I think I was actually tentatively down for that, and I'm, I don't think that should be me. So we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> worth comes to worth, um, we can just uh, we won't tell Mitch, but we'll just slot him in. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't got enough songs. content for one whole thing, but um, no. I'll, I'll, I'll gladly do one. Yeah, I was going to say, you'd just be like, this is VS Code. Just talk really <laughs> slowly. Wow. What, well, what I do actually need to do is automate the deployment of my VS Code because the hardest thing is you go to a new machine and then you forget what extensions and they don't really have like a proper sync like a normal browser yet. They've got setting sync. Uh, yeah, yeah, we got, sync in there. yeah, we got setting syncs now. Yeah, yeah. 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 And uh, you can yeah, install. Uh, there's a there's a PowerShell script on the gallery which allows you to install VS Code. You can also use that to uh, um, install um, the. Ex it has a um, like a thing where you can install extensions as well. So you just say, "Hey, I want PowerShell. Get you know, um, blah blah blah," and off it goes. Can, can you can you link me that, Michael? I need yeah. that in my life right now. So. Okay, let me let me jump on the PowerShell gallery because I used it to. Um, we wrote a. Um, Oh my god, I'm thinking I'm gonna lose power. Um, uh, oh, oh gosh. So, where is it? VS Code. <coughs> um,
um, install VS Code. Yeah, it's by the PowerShell team. So if you go install script name install VS hyphen code, um, that'll do it. Um, I'm just going to include it in the links that I need to um, add to the Slack channel that I'm doing right now. Is everyone on Slack right now? Yep. Yep. Okay, cool, cool, cool. All right. Um, I'm, I'm just going to stop recording. I dropped the mic one in there. Yeah. Um, okay.